I am not a fan of motorized lawn equipment, whether it's the mower, the weed eater, the edger, the noise of all of that just is a little bit too much for me, so I tend to prefer manual lawn equipment. Now we haven't yet gotten one of those mowers that doesn't have a motor for it, so the quick solution there is just to have the boys cut the grass and then I don't have to listen to it. But of all of the tools I have in my uh, lawn equipment repertoire, this is my favorite. This is my axe. Now the axe really only has one purpose, and that is to do what? Chop, Chop stuff down. Now, our backyard here is a bit of a jungle, and we've put out five or six cans of yard waste almost every week that we've lived here, and we've been here almost a year now. And so this tool has been used to cut down little trees, to tear out roots, but it's not a precise tool, is it? You wouldn't use this to do some fine carving of woodwork. You wouldn't use it to try to cut a two by four to a nice, clean, square, perfect length. It's pretty, just much, pretty much used for just hacking and whacking the stuff that needs to be cut down. Now this tool seems to be the tool of preference for the vineyard owner that Jesus talks about in the parable. He's got a tree that he's had for three years and it's not born any fruit and so he tells the gardener, cut it down and throw it out. It's wasting the soil. It's a waste of the soil, this tree. Now we have to back up and to the, get a run of this parable, Jesus is talking to a crowd of people and some of them are curious about some Galileans who died and their blood was mixed with the blood of their sacrifices and you can get a sense that this just horrifies these people. And they clearly seem to believe that this suffering that happened to them was a result of their sinfulness because Jesus' response to them is to say, no, they weren't any more sinful than anyone else. That's not why this happened. And to make sure that they understand that, he tells another one. He says, you all know about the tower that fell on those people. And they're probably all down their heads going, yeah, they were more sinful too. And Jesus says, no, the tower falling on them and that suffering was not an indication that they were any worse offenders than the rest of you. Then Jesus, in both of those accounts, says something that's a little bit confusing. He says, no, they weren't any more sinful. But if you don't repent, you will suffer the same death as they did. You also will suffer as you perish. And so you have to kind of say, well, what is it that Jesus is trying to say here? Is he trying to say that no, suffering is not an indication of your sinfulness, or if you don't repent, then you will? Well, in our day, we probably do a fair bit of applying people's sinfulness as the reason for their suffering. Sometimes it comes when there's a natural disaster. And some religious person will come out and say, well, this happened because God is punishing all of us for fill in the blank, whatever it is. And I would guess that many of us go, well, I'm not sure that's how God works. But on a regular day-to-day -day basis, we frequently apply people's suffering. We say that it's their own sinfulness that got them there. We used to live in Tampa. There was a women's prison not too far from us. And I'm sure a prison is an experience of suffering in lots of ways. But we would look at them and say, well... They got there on their own, didn't they? They committed crimes, the choices that they made, that's why they're there. Their sinfulness is why they are suffering. But as a culture, we deal uh, generally with people who are poor. We say, well, the reason that being poor is very stressful, not knowing where you're gonna eat your next meal, how you're gonna pay those bills, the ones that are stacking up. And so we look at poor people and say, well, you have a couple of sins that have gotten you here, laziness and want to live off the rest of us. We generally apply that suffering that they experience to some sinfulness of their own. But we don't just do it broadly. Many of you have either experienced yourself or known friends of yours that have gone through divorce because of infidelity. And we'll look and say, well, they created that situation, right? And then there's suffering that follows. And that suffering can be lots of things. I've uh, known couples who were deeply engaged in the life of the church. And when they got divorced, they, had to, they decided, like, one of us gets the church because of those relationships. And so there's suffering that goes along with that. And it's easy to look at people and say, well, you chose this by the actions that you had. Your sinfulness is the reason that you got here. More broadly, we'll talk about karma. We have cliches in our culture about sleeping in the bed you made or what goes around comes around. And all of those are ways that we explicitly or implicitly imply that your choices and your sinfulness is how you get to your suffering. Even the vineyard owner, as he comes in, says, well, cut that tree down, it's not bearing fruit. It is a waste of the soil. 
And as we begin to apply people's sinfulness to their suffering, it's easy to start to separate them from their humanity. I've heard people in my life called a waste of time. I've heard people called a waste of energy. I've heard people called a waste of talent or a waste of potential. I've heard people called a waste of space, a waste of breath, even a waste of a human being. And when we do that, we totally cut people off from being a beloved human creation child of God, and we apply to them some wastefulness, some sinfulness, some suffering. We blame it on them. And when we do that, it's easy to do what? Chop them off, right? Cut them away. Cut them away from the human community that they're tied to, whether that's a family, whether it's a church community, whether it's our culture. And so those people that get put into prison, we cut them off from all aspects of the rest of the life we have together. We cut off people who live in poverty from resources and schools. There's all sorts of ways that we cut people off. And in that way, we can start to think, if you really look at it, that we live in a one-tool town. And that one tool is the axe. And we chop, chop, chop out of judgment against others. The trick with living in a one-tool town, though, is there's only one tool, and sooner or later that one tool is going to land on you. And that one tool can land on people that are bearing fruit or not bearing fruit. It's easy for us to look at some of the people that we may think of as a waste or who we apply their sinfulness to their suffering and say, well, they're not bearing fruit, so let's cut them off. But when the axe is swinging in the one-tool town, it sooner or later will hit just about everyone because judgment has a tendency to do that. That women's prison in Riverview was closed. It was a small prison. There were only about 300 prisoners there. And if you were to look at recidivism rates, and I read a report from 2003 to 2010 from the Florida Department of Corrections that looked at recidivism rates, and it looked to see how many people go back to prison within the first three years. And that rate for women is lower than for men, is I think about 19%. Now it's hard to find statistics on this women's prison in Riverview, but the rate there was, a, one article says 6%, another says less than 10%. The quote from the Department of Corrections says, it's not necessarily accurate that the number is that low, which is not a wholesale condemnation of it. But there generally in the community was a belief that this prison, small though it was, was doing wonderful work keeping women from coming back to prison, but it was expensive, $8 million a year. So when the acts of budget cuts started to fall, this place that was reducing recidivism rates by a good deal in one particular community, for two reasons, they had faith-based education programs and faith-based education programs, the acts fell and said, nope, it's too expensive, we can put those prisoners someplace else. Now, the fight against this closing was Bipartisan and the whole community was against it because people saw the value in this place. But if you look at the recidivism report, it's an interesting thing. The character, there's a whole part of it that talks about how those rates are calculated and what factors in. And the things that factor in, you might expect. How many crimes have they been convicted of? How many times have they been in prison? What sorts of other behaviors have they had in their past? All of which is backward looking. And then looking out forward, there's just a little bit about do they have supportive family, supportive friends. Nowhere in those rates is there any calculation of rehabilitation. Nowhere is there any accounting for grace. And so it's no wonder that when the axe starts to fall, a place that's even bearing fruit has to go because it's too expensive, because the calculations don't include the idea that we might be, indeed, redeemable people. Now, as Jesus goes into this parable, there's this tree that's been called a waste, and the vineyard owner seems to have one tool in mind, and that tool is the axe. I have another favorite tool in my garage. It is a uh, shovel. Now, this particular shovel I bought to be a snow shovel because the other snow shovels, uh, I didn't like them all that much. They felt flimsy. And this is what I grew up with as a snow shovel. And you can see the edge is a little not what it used to be. That's from scraping ice off sidewalks in St. Louis in the wintertime. It's terrible. But the, way, the reason I knew this could be a snow shovel was because this was the snow shovel we had when I grew up. But the one we had when I grew up had a different purpose before that. My mom grew up on a farm. Any guesses what it was used for? Scooping poop, right? 
So you take a shovel like that. This is the other tool that Jesus brings into the equation. Because the gardener says, hey, this tree is not a waste. Just give me some time. Let me shovel around it. Let me put some manure in there, some nutrients that might help this tree to bear fruit. It is a statement in this parable about God's patient grace. And if you just sit down and read the whole Bible and say, I'm going to look for God's patient grace, you will find it all the way through. After the flood, God says, I'm never going to do that again. And as people grow up again and become sinful again, they end up in slavery and God frees them. They end up with asking for a king and God says, that's a bad idea. So they get kings and most of the kings are evil. They end up in exile and God brings them back. God's patient grace comes again and again until Jesus comes along as one of us. And I can imagine this parable stops there, but if it went on, I like to believe that the next year the tree still didn't bear fruit. And the vineyard owner kept said, it's time to cut it down. And the gardener said, just give me another year. Just give me one more. And the next year, maybe still didn't bear fruit. And the gardener said, just give me another year. Until the vineyard owner said, that is it. Grabs the axe himself. And then this is when the gardener says, you know what? Cut me down instead. That's how Jesus gets to the cross. Because people continue and continue <laughs> to just live in separation from God. We continue to cut people off until Jesus comes along and says, no, cut me off instead. Let me be the one that takes the axe that gets hung on the tree so that you all can be free and have new life, to have redemption. It is about God's patient grace, and God's patient grace grows us beyond who we are because it comes with fertilizer. It comes with these waters that feed us and grow us. It comes with a meal that feeds us and gives us nutrients for this journey that we have through life. God's patient grace grows us beyond who we are. Because Jesus doesn't need an axe, Jesus brings a shovel. Now that women's prison, I told you, there was a big fight to keep it open. And it wasn't just because people knew the recidivism rates were low. It was because there were what I would like to call gardeners of grace that volunteered there. 400 some people in the community, many of them retired people, many of them people of faith, retired women that went and did these things. They went to this prison. They were the ones that ran the programs. They were the ones that showed up and mentored these women. They were the ones who heard their stories. And we want to say, well, they're all in prison. They deserve to be there. Some of these women fought back against longtime abusers. And their fighting back for themselves and for their children landed them in prison. And so they sat with them, they taught them, they listened to their stories, they mentored them, they encouraged them, they invested in them. So when they said, we're going to close this place, those 400 people said, oh, no, you're not. And they fought and fought and fought because they had seen resurrection. They had seen redemption. They had seen what it looks like when you get rid of the axe and bring a shovel instead to invest in people. Now, eventually, the axe was too big and too strong and the place did close. <laughs> One of the women I know that volunteered there said that uh, they had promised that these women would go to similar programs in other prisons. And she, many of them couldn't continue to, to go visit because they moved them so far away, but she did. She would send letters, letters would come to the church from the woman that she visited. But she came to me one day and she said, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I have never seen her without hope. She's completely lost hope. And this woman had a long, long sense, maybe even been a life sense. But she's, she said she's never been without hope totally, and now she's there. She has gotten to a place of complete and utter darkness, and I don't know what to do. And I didn't know what to tell her other than to just say, keep showing up with the shovel. Keep investing, keep bringing that encouragement and that grace. And some months later she came and she said, you know what? She's doing better. She's still in prison. She's still suffering. But there was a little bit of hope. And I believe that little bit of hope came because someone who knew they had been redeemed and invested in and brought to this place by God's grace that grows us beyond who we are was willing to carry that grace to this person to remind her that God's grace too will grow her beyond who she is. As we go out from this place into a one-tool town where the axe is always swinging, May we be blessed to remember that Jesus invests in us, that Jesus comes to us again and again with grace to grow us beyond who we are, with an eternal patience that never runs out. And may we be blessed to remember then that because we've been given that new life, we are gardeners of grace, gifted to remind people that God never gives up on them either. Amen.